In 1968, Dodge introduced the second generation Charger. In 1969, the Charger underwent a few styling changes, such as the taillights, grille, and side markers. In 1970, more changes were in store for the final year of the second generation Charger. A slight modification to the taillights, side markers, front bumper, and grille. At Graveyard Cars, we are currently restoring more than a dozen of these legendary Mopar muscle cars. With powertrains running from the 383 Magnum all the way up to the 426 Hemi. To date, you've watched us restore the most iconic, rare and sought after chargers in the world. And now our legacy continues with the final assembly of this all numbers matching 1969 Charger RTSE 440 Magnum 4 speed supercar. This is Graveyard Cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Very deep in the Pacific Northwest. One team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible. Finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman. His cousin, Doug. His daughter, Alyssa. His best friend, Royal. His painter, Will and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. A few seasons ago, we introduced this 1969 Dodge Charger RTSE. This is a really neat car in as much as it's not just an RTSE, but it's a four-speed, a factory four-speed, and it's numbers matching. So when we brought the car in, basically I walked around it, showed you the things that were original on it and not original on it. It really was a nice, complete car. Original engine, original transmission. It didn't run and drive because the motor had grenaded. So like with all of them, the first step, once it makes its way in the queue, is to disassemble it down to the bare body, send it out and have it dipped. So when the car came back from the dipper, it was in really nice shape. Previous sins showed up, previous sins and repairs to the quarter panels, which were so much that we decided we would put full quarters on. We might have been able to get away with a patch panel, I always think that it's in the best interest these days, if you're gonna have that many patches, just to put a quarter panel on it. We did both quarter panels, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, small patches in the wheelhouse, and the taillight panel. Now, because we have so many cars at Graveyard Cars, we can't feature every step of the restoration on every single car. We did happen to catch footage of the T7 copper, beautiful color, being painted by Will, and it came out gorgeous. I'm excited to do T7. It's the first time we've ever done it. T7's nice. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous brown metallic. Because it's a metallic, we have to paint the car all as one. That way it guarantees everything matches nice. Once Will was finished with the paint work, they did the wet sanding, the buffing, got it all prettied up, did the undercoating on the bottom side, and it was ready to move into the assembly shop. We're about to put the back half of the car together. So this is a AMD bumper. I just wanted to share with everybody how nice these have gotten over the years. Originally when they first started making them, they had a little bit of fitment issues, <laughs> but even the chrome on this is show chrome. Look yeah, at the triple great. plated chrome. It's just absolutely gorgeous. You know, once a month or so, I like to get out there and work with the guys, kind of remind them that I can still get my hands dirty and I know what I'm doing. And it's good team building stuff. They probably won't admit it, but I think they actually love when I get out there and go shoulder to shoulder with them, mano y mano, and work on these cars together, so. Love's a strong word. And the other thing I want to say is these studs, these are actually bolts that go through from the back side, and it has a little keeper on it. And that allows you to be able to move this from side to side, because you need to be able to adjust the bumper. These are the gaskets that go on. So these are going to keep the water out of the trunk compartment. Mark is very knowledgeable. So if I ever have any questions about a car or any special models of these cars, I can go straight to him. What's better than just having him right there when you have a question? So we just got to be mindful of the lower brackets. Don't scratch anything. Come up through the hole openings. I'm lined up. I am too. Good. Just get him started in there. I think the tail end of the 69 
is a little classier than even the 70. I yeah. don't like the trim panel on the 70, even though I owned one. So what we're talking about here is the subtle differences between the 69 Charger and the 70 Charger rear body area. The 70 uses a rear finish panel that has the RT called out on it, and the 69 Charger uses a call out emblem that actually sticks to the body itself. I'm just gonna give it a little something. Okay. Look at that beautiful thing. Now, just something else to show here real quick. New foam gaskets, reconditioned original. So what are you doing on these? You're water blasting these? So a lot of steps, I'll sandblast it on a really, really low setting with that new blaster that we got. I'll take some Scotch-Brite and then some polish on the Scotch-Brite. And then you just leave it and natural. Leave it natural. And these are brand new reproduction bezels we're getting from Classic Industries that go on there. But these are original taillights, aren't they? Yeah, The lenses originals. themselves. They cleaned up really nice. All right, go ahead and set that bad boy in there. Goes right on those studs. Fantastic, go ahead and put a nut on there. All right, so he's putting the nuts on there. Those are factory fasteners. So one more little factoid here on the 70 taillights is a car that was manufactured before January of 1970 had one taillight style. If it was manufactured after about January 1st of 1970, the Department of Transportation implemented a new rule saying that that taillight had to have a small reflective strip in it. So if you were sitting on the side of the road, it was dark out, you didn't have your lights on, and a car coming up behind you had his lights on, he would see that reflector and know there's a car sitting there. All right, the next part that's gonna go on is our RT emblem, beautiful. This is a new uh, reproduction, it's classic industries part, but it is nice. See, they have a sealer on there. And that sealer on there is what's gonna keep us from having water come inside the car. AMD supplied us with the rear tail panel for this car. The holes were not drilled for the RT emblem, so I had to do them myself. So I took measurements from an original tail panel to get the holes, but some of these actually came crooked. But I took the time, took the measurements, and then straightened them out to make sure this emblem was perfectly straight. When it came to the 73 Challenger, it's also kind of exciting because it's a black car. I haven't done a black car on the show yet. 73, so it's, you know, eh. But it's at that point where it's time to get color going, so we've got the engine compartment prepped out, the jams prepped out, and we can get them black now. One of the great things about doing these apart in the single stage black, you get it shipped to you. It's just a gallon of black, and it's all the same. It's ready to go. I set the booth temp at about 70 degrees and use an 85 degree temp reducer because it'll lay out better. One of the advantages, like I said, of doing this apart is you got your doors laying down. You can really lay these panels out. So it's super nice to do this whole process in the way that we're doing it. The only downfall is the body guys really got to be careful putting it together, but we have a good team. So this car is going to look great from start to finish. These are the rear body trim pieces. There's a left and a right to it. These I actually sent out and had re -chromed. They do make reproductions, but they were on back order at the time. So we re these and detailed them. You know, one of the hardest things that we have any time when restoring a car is getting the parts for it. Getting the correct parts, number one, making sure they're a good quality reproduction part that you'd want on your car. You pick up the phone, you call your Classic Industries, Dante, one of the guys, I need this tail light molding. Well, Classic makes this particular one, but they're on global back order because of the pandemic and all the things that are going on. So what are you going to do, right? You're gonna deliver a car without them? No, you take the original ones, you cherry pick through all of them that you have, and you find the ones that are re and that's what we did. Because the fact is, if the parts are diminished, it ain't getting finished. So that's the Johnny Cochran right there, in case you're wondering. If the glove don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> OJ was trying to put the glove on, he was, you know, he was coming like this. So he's an actor. The screw, there's one screw that goes in down here. Okay. There you go. 
Could you get a longer one? Yeah. One, one with one that would go like five feet away from the car. Why would you have a screwdriver that long? Because I don't. My other one. Because you've home. lost your number no, my two. Other one's at home. Ah, typical mechanic. That is a number yeah. two. Go ahead and bring that thing in there. Boy, that's nice. Okay, so he's going to tighten that down, and now we'll put the cross piece on. Now, when you see parts going on, like these moldings, and they just seem to fall on, all the moldings fit real nice, and the taillight openings are great, that isn't by accident. That's by design. We pre-fit every one of those pieces of trim on the car back, way back in the metal stage. Then we also fit them all the way through the mud stage, because sometimes you have to build a corner up so that you won't have a gap underneath it. So the ones that are out there doing these body and paint restorations and you see that the back windows don't fit or the taillight moldings don't fit or the side marker opening, it's because they didn't pre-fit them. It is always by design when our cars look the way they do when they're finished. See, you got me a stubby screwdriver for this one. Didn't want to deal with that three foot long one. Not that I'm not used to that. <laughs> Is that better? That's much nicer. Easier to handle for you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful. Great. Remember, ridges always go up like that. So we know this is the top of the cylinder. This gasket will keep the water from going in. And then this is the retaining clip, which is a torsion clip. It'll go on like that right there. All I'm talking about there on the key is that if you're a Chrysler person, you've been around them. Something unique about them is that when you put a trunk key in the cylinder or an ignition key in the cylinder or a door key in the cylinder, the ridges go up. The flat spot of the key is down. The ridges go up. And that's because the tumblers are on the top side of the locks. All those little keyed tumblers are up there, and it pushes them up and down accordingly. Now, a GM being a loser car, <laughs> thumbs down, all the ridges go down on it. And because Ford doesn't know what it is, it has ridges on both sides. And lined up there. Perfect. Now that the engine bay and the door jams are all shot, I can go ahead and get the car ready for final paint. E-body door jams are easy. They don't get a two-tone like the B-bodies. So basically, you just get it all prepped out, mask it up a little bit, and then you shoot it black and you're done. When it comes to spraying the fenders, I actually don't mask off the inside. The inside of the fenders have been texture coated, so they're good already. I basically take a piece of inch and a half tape, run it around the border of the fender. I know not to put my gun back there and spray. I spray just the front. We have a great booth, pulls it right off to the side. You're good to go. You know, we just started doing the textures on the inside of the fender a handful of cars ago. It does a couple great things. First of all, factory did it. It protects from chips. It just gives it an overall very clean, very sanitary look. When you paint over it, it all looks so nice. And we got the technique, which takes trial and error, but we got a great technique doing it now, and it looks amazing. With all the jam work being knocked out, at that point, let it sit for a few days to where I can turn the doors over, mask up the fresh jammed area, and then do the final paint. And because it is black, I can paint the whole thing apart, buffed apart, put together. It makes the process a little bit quicker. All right, last pieces are the backup lights. So on the backup light, there's actually SE writing that says 69 and R. This is glass. This is stainless steel. On the back side, you have a gasket. And again, an original housing, an original pigtail on it. You just go in here. You have to make this plug in here. You'll notice that on the reverse lights, there's only one wire going to them. That's because the housing itself grounds through the body. So when you put those two screws through that stainless steel, the body of the backup light is being grounded by the car, and all it needs is a power source. All right, well with that, we're gonna go ahead and put the bumblebee stripe on next and then the side markers. Yeah, that'd be cool. And before we're done, I just wanna put a little power to those uh, backup lights and okay. see if they work. Oh yeah. So go ahead and go around. I hooked up that jumper wire. Let there be light. Genesis chapter one, verse three. Biblical.
this gorgeous 1970 Coronet RT convertible left the factory with a 426 Hemi, four-speed manual transmission, and a power convertible top. True or false, it is the only one that left the factory with those options. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I'll let you know how you did. All right, ghouls, how did we do on that one? Is this 1970 Dodge Coronet 426 Hemi four-speed convertible top the only one that ever left the assembly line with those particular options? If you said true, you were wrong. Bit of a trick question, though, in fairness to you. The fact is, there were two of these cars built. The other one has been gone since the 70s when it was totaled. So technically, it's the only car left on the planet. But in reality, two of these cars left the assembly line. Because these cars need to be perfect when they leave graveyard cars, I do like to get involved, and especially on a black car. Will's fortunate that I am here to help him, and I'm happy to help him. Little Nick right there, he can take care of. And I know he'll heed the things that I'm going over. It takes me a while, it takes away from my day. I know he respects and appreciates that, so I hope it really helps. You know, there's quite a few things I'm looking for when I go over these cars. I'm looking for any old lines from where one primer started and another one stopped that might give us a hard line underneath the paint. I'm looking for any shiny areas, or thingies as I used to call them. This area is always weird. He's still got some shinies right here, right here, and a little bit at the front edge where it could be not scuffed properly, and that could be an adhesion problem for the paint down the road. Maybe it's not wiped down properly. It has perhaps a tape line that didn't get sanded all the way out. Maybe there's a pinhole. I mean, these are all real things, and they're the kind of things that it's so overwhelming for a painter to look over every square inch of a car. This is really helpful. It was always helpful for me when I was a young painter, getting help from the big brother figure, and I know Will really appreciates this too. It's gonna make this car just beautiful. So in the morning, he'll come in, address all those things, take him about an hour, hour and a half to massage those little areas out. He'll have to re-wax and grease it, blow it down, tack it, and it's ready to go. God, I hate this so much. When it comes to stuff like this, this is total respect. He just does this for you people at home. That's it. It does no benefit to my job. Putting tape on there is great if there was a problem, but I've been doing this a long time, there is no problem. He takes a car that's freshly wax and greased, freshly tacked off, ready to spray, brings the camera crew in, thinking they're gonna film something good. They don't because it's just silliness. I help him out of respect and he would do the same thing for me. And what I am doing for him, I know means the world to him because it helps him be the very best painter on the planet. I think it's great that we're at that point in our relationship now. Mutual respect. So he contaminates the area. I have to go back in, re-wax and grease everything, re-tack everything off. So those bits you guys get at home, they're actually 30 minute setbacks. This is a great example of teamwork personified. That car is flawless. It looks like a sheet of glass. That's what happens when two of the best painters in the world collaborate to make a car perfect. What'd you say? We'll pull all the tape off the paint before you start. How would you even know that? I filmed it. I was there filming it. Were you? Yes, sir. You were there, were you, Judas? And this is the first time hearing of it? After I went in and redid all of Mark's silliness that he does for attention, at that point, we're ready to paint. I love the black single stage. It covers quick. You just walk past the booth, and you see the shine and the depth just in the first coat, and you can tell how great this car is going to look. With four coats on it and buffed out and assembled, it's going to look amazing.
So after it's sat for a couple weeks, we do the cut and buff. We got a bunch of cars to do, so we can literally just set this car to the side at that point, move on to another one. Once that two weeks is up, kick Noah loose on it. Okay, so just to clarify where we're at right now, Justin and I have took the time to figure out where this stripe goes in space. It's really important because as these quarter panel stripes go out, they have to follow the trajectory of this deck lid stripe. So if this deck lid stripe were like that, if it was cocked off a little bit, there's no way you're gonna put that stripe on and have it land where it's supposed to land, right in the center of the side marker openings. The trajectory would be wrong. This is where Mark's years of experience is invaluable. So we have to put this up where we believe it goes, fit each quarter panel stripe, move this a little bit, fit them again, and we do that for about 20, 30 minutes, and right now we believe we have it exactly where it goes, so we're gonna install it. One other thing to point out here is these little black dots that you see. So the key is in the center of the body panel. So what we want is this peak that you can clearly see in the stripe right here, because you see this comes to a peak, right? To be aligned with that dot. So we know that left and right, this thing is where it goes. We got a dot right there and that dot right there. We want to go left, right, left, right on it. So now we have all of our marks, we can put it together. When you talk about graphics on a Mopar, they're all over the place. They got real prevalent in the late 60s and early 70s. Billboard decals, hockey sticks, black house on the hood. I mean, there is a whole gamut of different vinyl graphics for these cars. And prior to recently, I did all these myself. And if you wonder why, just go back and take a look. So like I worked with Alyssa and Will one time, I tried to teach them how to do a billboard graphic on a CUDA. I think it was the Phantom CUDA. Even though I walked through it with them blow by blow, they disregarded it and did it their way. Look what you've done. Uh-oh. What have you done? We got problems. <laughs> what have you done? I didn't do anything. Like that song, I did it my way. So this is just a simple application gel that we buy from Phoenix Graphics, same place that give us our stripes. We don't always use the application gel. Sometimes I make up my own formula, like on the graphics for the billboards, I'll make up my own soapy solution. The reason for all that is I gotta have time to move that stripe. You lay it on there and it looks great. You look at the center of it, you look at the side of it. It's all on your marks where you think it's gonna be. You begin to squeegee it and all of a sudden it moves on the other side. I gotta be able to peel that whole thing back up again and lay it back down. So yeah, I want lots of application gel. I want lots of time. Until that thing is locked down and I know it's perfect, I want to be able to move it around. All right, and we line this one up right where it goes there. Move this one up till it hits. One of the great things about a car that comes in like this one did is it allows me to document it like on our Daytona Charger. On that particular car, I was able to photograph exactly where the decal was put on at the factory, not where Bill put his on at or Fred does, or, or even maybe perhaps where the schematics say it should go, but actually where it was on that car. And that's one of the things that was a huge advantage on this car is it was a good original paint car when we started, so there was a lot of DNA markers. I was able to photograph and document exactly where that bumblebee stripe went and duplicate it with the new stripe. So once you got the decal set into space and where it needs to go, one of the most tedious parts is squeegeeing out the application gel. A little messy, but that's okay. Not the first time I got a little messy. <laughs> We undercoat almost all of our cars, you know, whatever the factory did on that particular car or whatever sellout Mark wants to throw on some random car or whatever. This car, not original anything, I don't believe, but he wanted to undercoat it. I put one coat on, it covers quickly. I don't like to get a lot of buildup on there. I've said this 100 times. You look at our cars that are undercoated, you can see how clean we put in floor pans and trunk floors and extensions. So I just do one coat, and it takes a little bit to make sure you got every angle, this and that. Then at that point, I'll kick it over to assembly, and it takes a good week for it to fully cure out, but it does look amazing. It protects the car down the road, adds a lot of life, and it keeps it very, very nice looking. All right, so we have our bumblebee stripe in place and dry. So all we gotta do now is remove the backing paper without causing any damages. 
Once we do that, we will roll the edges, show you how that's done, because it's a little tricky, and then we can move on to the quarter decal. So what we've got to do is pull the actual decal away from the backing paper. We'll have to trim a little bit off We've got a lot right? of it. Yeah. They do make the stripes a little long, which is good. And so once we do wrap that corner, we'll have to cut some of the excess off. This is probably the hardest part, is just getting it started nice and even. So when I keep running the squeegee over the decal on the backing paper, sometimes that pressure will actually separate the adhesive on the backing paper to the decal itself. Don't worry, it's okay. You know, it'll wipe off. Just use a nice adhesive remover, something that's really mild and not a super hot product. But when you want to pull that backing paper off, you just find the edge and really gently pull it and separate it from each other, or else you can stretch out that decal. And you don't want to do that because it'll skew your lines. And what we were dealing with on the other side, just to stop right there, was getting this thing started. That's what you saw us fumbling over there with, is see, when I lift up the backing paper, the decal comes with it. So you have to pull the decal away from it, like that. Now, I don't have to on this side. I can just pull it off. But on the other side, that's what's so hard, is pulling that one loose and then this long one across here and getting the backing paper off of it. But right now, we're just going to remove this. Hopefully, nothing silly happens. Just like that. Now, it wants to curl up. So what we're going to do is open the deck lid, and we're going to make our corner. you got to be real careful when you make this corner, because you already see that there's starting to be a little bit of air bubbling in there. So you have to be tight up against that corner, that edge, as you roll it. Wrapping the decals around an edge is more of a technique than anything. One of the first ones I did, I had some air bubbles, and I didn't like it, so I think we ended up redoing it. Mark actually showed me a technique where I can pull the decal tight and wrap it around the corner so it doesn't cause any bubbles. We'll start with this one right here. It's got to come around this corner real nice and tight, so you want to press it up against there. Press it up against that edge, and then pull this tail tight like that. Then press it into place, just like that right there. Make sure it's down real good with your thumb or finger. Press in. We'll do this other outside one right here. Again, press it nice and tight while you're pulling here, around that corner, up into place. In a perfect world, it should land right there where this one did. But they do cut them a little long, so sometimes we have to trim along that seam. Now, this one's a little tougher because it's longer. So I'm just going to go in segments. Press this down as I go right here. Now, does it matter if you start from the middle or? Probably better to start from the center. Oh, I never really okay. stopped and thought about it, but just keep rolling that corner, rolling it till you're around it. Once you do, then you can make that first press. Second one, third. That one almost came out perfect, didn't it? Yeah, it looks great. Hardly any trimming on that one. Really, very little. That one came out really nice. Turning back the clock on Graveyard Cars to season one, we restored this beautiful 1970 in violet Plymouth Roadrunner. What engine did it have? Was it 340, 383, 446 barrel? If you're true fans of the show and you've been watching for a long time, stay tuned after the break and let me know what you think. Welcome back.
The last thing I have to paint with the car being done and all the jam works that's done is the, just the doors and fenders. My man! Ha <laughs> ha, gun doors! You get ready to paint just, the challenger pieces? Yeah. I know what he was going to do. I knew he was going to peel the tape off. I just wanted those people at home to see it. And that is exactly why I demanded that we do a paint off, that we walk into that booth mano y mano and lay some paint out because he's too big for his britches. That TX9 black, 9300. No, 9300. 9300 PPG. TX9 is different. Polyurethane clear. It's different. Huh? Mark's everywhere, I mean, mentally also, but he just wants his hand in everything. This hand has laid out some paint jobs over the years. I painted the 1970 Dodge Charger RT, 426 Hemi, four-speed, burnt orange, white top, black interior car, one of 56 only built, probably one of only one ever made with that particular combination. I sprayed it, not Will. Is this a single stage? Yeah. Yeah, no, TX9 is different because it has two grams of black and one drop of white in it. Actually, it's not white, it's purple. Yeah. So I'm here to bond with you. What are you talking about? It's our monthly thing. No, it's... Yeah. Every month we get together and we do a little bit of bonding. The Iceman and Willy Wonka. What do you, what's your handle? What, you, what is happening? What do you call it? Group? Magic hat? Yeah, magic what? hat. We're going to do a little painting together. I'm probably at the point now, I'm just going to go back to spring and not telling anybody. Or Saturdays. Those are my favorite. We don't bond. We bond very we bond? good. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. works out great because I'm having actually the whole crew, camera huh? guys and everything out to my house on Saturday. For what? Barbecue. What Saturday? This coming Saturday. You know I can't come this Saturday. There's a big difference between bonding at work and bonding in the social life, OK? I've been around a long time. I don't know what goes on out there in Dexter at his house. I see pictures on Monday of everybody, the audio guy sitting over there. He's usually blacked out upside down in a lawn chair. Will's always drunk and hugging everybody with some great big smile on his face. No women around, which frankly is the whole reason I would even go. OK, so no, I don't want to go bond under those circumstances, all right? OK, well, I'm going to go paint two doors and two fenders. Yeah. And uh, OK. <laughs> yeah, you're oh. not a sellout. <laughs> Show the fucking shirt. Show the fucking shirt. How much did you get paid for it? Is that the butt function for Junction? No. It's a show that you sponsor. I'll see you in the booth. No? No, sir. Hey, this is a guy I've been telling you about. <laughs> <laughs> Mother You know, I don't get to paint that often, so when I do, I take it seriously. I think that it's a big responsibility. Materials cost a lot of money, and people look up to us to be the best. So when I go in there, it's game on for me. This is Super Bowl. It ain't Sunday, but it's Super Bowl for me. This is exhausting. I'm gonna get my 1,000 yards. You know, remember when Refrigerator Perry scored a touchdown in the Super Bowl? Yeah, that's me. The fact that I don't get a paint very often and that I've got a brand new paint gun that I have never used before, it takes a while to set them up. You want to set up the fan, you want to set up the pressure, you want to set up the volume, you want to make sure you don't have any leaks or something's going to drip on it, all right? It's like the preparation for a fight. You don't see Rocky Balboa just jump out of bed and then get in the ring with Apollo Creed and start throwing punches. No, he's getting in shape, man. He's getting ready. He's doing all the head bobbing stuff. He's running around in those stinky sweats, drinking a glass of eggs, right? Doing stuff with Adrian that supposedly, which has always bothered me, is she says in Rocky, I've never been in an apartment with a man. I respect that. She's very shy. She should be. But in the same scene, she's on the ground wallowing around with the Italian stallion. <laughs> I just think the writing was off on that.
You know, I just tune him out. You know, whatever he thinks is wrong, it's not. I'll have to fix whatever he wants fixed, and I have to do it all later. Charlie Brown teacher. I want to call my brother. I got to I got I don't know. What's the next question? Okay, so the name of the game is just get this top set, but make sure your trajectory's right. So let me keep lots of juice on everything. Okay, go ahead and set that down. This style line that you see here should underline, very close to underline the R on the RT. That's what I've seen historically. And then you want the side marker centered in the opening of this black. And then the bottom tail should be pretty close to the bottom of the car. Yeah, like right there, yeah, I like yeah. that. Okay, so how is it for up and down? For up and down, we're a little low on this T. A little low, so it would need to come toward me? Uh, yeah. But you want the bottom of that stripe all the way at the bottom of the quarter? Yeah. Well, we also got this um, this corner here. Now, that's right on the money there. Yeah. We're a little forward. I mean, you, you want to come down here and check? Does it need See? to go back? Yeah. Oh, well, it can go back a little bit. Can it? Yeah. Yeah, I think our spacing down here now is pretty good. You got it where you like it? Yeah. Okay, I got it here. We're set now. Yeah, you're don't set turn, now. Don't turn it back. See that? Drives you crazy. You get bubbles. You get bubbles, folks. Where the decal wraps around the corner and goes down is a very critical area. You have to pull it tight while the other person runs the squeegee. It's not mandatory, but it sure does help. Okay, so we're good right to here now. So now's where we gotta make this corner and not end up with anything funky. So double check and make sure that your trajectory is good. If we're gonna do anything, it's now. Still nice? Yep. Great. Pretty good. Okay, so I need you to pull tension down on that. In any situation, I don't care what it is, whether you're being judged for something or whether you're competing in something, whether you're waiting for the right answer, just don't panic, be cool. Be the ice tray. Don't be like Will and like Alyssa where they panic and make all these mistakes and do things, steal cars and run paint and you know spray it again, Sam. It, be cool, man. Slightly creepy, just slightly. All kidding aside, we have a lot of fun, but this is a beautiful car. When it is outside, detailed, with it's a rocker molding car. It's got obviously belt molding, it's a charger. That beautiful T7 with the bumblebee, the black top, the black leather interior, it's just gonna glow. This car is gonna be one of the prettiest second generation chargers we've ever done. So I'm so excited to see it done. And I know the guy that owns it can't wait to get it back. Learning so much from Mark has made me feel so much more comfortable working on these cars. You know, when you first come in here, you can be super nervous. You're touching these high-end cars. I mean, these are other people's cars that you're dealing with and you do not want to mess them up. I was more comfortable taking my car from scratch this time, basically, and rebuilding my own car. I had a 72 Charger that I bought when I was 15 for 500 bucks, and I was scared to do so many different things on it. But after working here and learning from Mark, I was able to do that on my own car and make it my own and have a car that I've always wanted to have. So it's just been so great and I'm not scared to work on somebody else's car at the shop. Once the stripes are on, we are ready to install the side markers. If you notice, they're black because it's a black striped car, so it's gotta match the stripe. If it had a white bumblebee stripe, the side marker housings would be white to match the decal. Not to be biased, but I believe that the panels that I painted came out beautiful. I didn't even go over and look at Will's. I'm sure they're beautiful too. 
but I know Will. And I know six months down the road, he's going to know I forgot all about it because that's part of my charm. I do forget things. I want to have it judged independently. Just, just bring somebody in that doesn't know anything. A simpleton. I have no idea why they wanted me to judge the paint. I'm a mechanic, not a painter, but Mark's the boss. That's my man. You in there with the eyeballs. You worried? No, I'm Gots not worried. to be worried. Why should I be worried? I'd be real worried. You saw it, it's like a sheet of glass. You know, then Doug coming in to look at the panels that have been painted. I don't know why I'm even in here. Well, it looks like the ocean has got waves in it. Ah, okay. Well, we don't want that one. They all look great to me. Can you tell him that? No, Doug, I've got to have you pick one door and one fender. <sighs> Looks good. Looking good. Yeah, we'll just let him be his own judge. That's the most important thing is just let him be independent and let him call it the way he sees it. Mark's to my right over here giving signals because he wants to make sure his get picked. I walked around them for a while. Looked like I knew what I was doing. This one looks pretty good. I like that one. And then I just mentally tossed a coin. They all look great to me. I couldn't tell who painted what. Oh, there he goes. He's done. What'd you think, Rooster? Pete, you got one coming. Not much I can tell you. You know what happens when the elevator doors open on the party. Game over. Yeah, not saying that's gonna happen, but it's a threat. Well, am I Leonardo DiCaprio, or Oh, don't fly to yourself. No, no. I'll be in your apartment. You're going to come home with a bag of groceries, get ready to have a nice dinner by yourself. Boom, game over. Good luck sleeping tonight. Or maybe tomorrow night. Oh, Matt Damon's not bad. He's what? I mean, he's not a bad actor to be compared to. You said no, I'm not comparing you to an actor. I'm telling you my level of frustration. I'm going to go back to the shop after this. Everyone's getting departed. You guys all get to go home early today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome. <sighs> We done?